so many uh, friendly, familiar faces. Um, and I just want to share what uh, some of Matt's sentiment about these fires. I know that uh, Kirk Dieter yesterday put out, just speaking again to Matt's really good point about how TU comes through for the places that we uh, live, love, and fish. I know Kirk put a call out to the industry uh, for help um, yesterday in angling trade. Josh Duplachain was up there on one of the ranches uh, helping to corral horses and livestock in an area that was burning. Um, other, t other of your, I think you have 19 staff in the state from the national organization. And I know several have been helping out in some of the capacities that Matt mentioned. So for those of you who actually are in harm's way, please know that uh, you are in my prayers. And if there's anything that we can do, don't hesitate to reach out. Sadly, I think that these fires are, um, this isn't, uh, it's not unexpected. It's, this is even worse than, uh, you know, the Hayman fire. It's worse than some of these big fires you've had in your past. It's, it, I don't think it's going to get any better anytime soon. And uh, I think Matt's response in terms of what we need to do to help the Forest Service uh, protect Colorado's namesake watershed is exactly the right question to begin uh, this presentation. So um, just a tip of the hat to the 24 or so, maybe it's 22 chapter presidents that are here. Uh, I've, uh, I think I might've told this story at one of the CTU banquets a few years ago, but, but maybe not. Um, I, you know, this, it's funny, the secrets that we keep as adults that become revealed occasionally. And uh, we were at a Thanksgiving dinner, maybe two, three years ago. And I, I told my mom, I said, you know, mom, it always meant so much to me after you would send me to bed uh, without dinner and you'd come up and sit in the edge of the bed and say, because uh, I had been bad, you'd say, listen, Chris, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm doing this because you're my favorite son. And Nick, John and Emmett all proceeded to tell me, but wait a minute, mom, you said that I was your favorite son. Um, so I often go to uh, banquets and pretend that the chapter or the council uh, that I'm visiting with and that are feeding me and, and uh, entertaining me are my favorite council. But uh, it is not an exaggeration to say that the Colorado Council is, in fact, my favorite council. And the reason for that is this, that you all, right, this is a, can you see that? One to you. When, uh, when you all put together your annual uh, report, you cannot see the difference between uh, the work of a chapter, the work of the council, or the work of national staff. And that is an example for the rest of the organization and one that we're trying to build off through this strategic plan. So I want you to know that we're going to talk about a few ideas in here that um, will sound a little innovative and different for TU. They're really not. We're just trying to take some things to scale uh, that, frankly, the council has shown us. And I, when I say the council, I mean all of you collectively the national staff, the 24 chapters, and Dave and his wonderful uh, staff as well. So I'm going to take you very quickly through about five or six months of really intense work. Uh, this is an ever-evolving document. I know that all of you um, had a chance to review the strategic plan framework. You may or may not have gotten a slide deck. I will tell you that that framework is different this morning than it was when I sent it to Mac three days ago, and it's going to be different again. And I'm going to I'm going to move fairly quickly here because I want to leave most of our time for conversation and discussion. Um, but I want you to know that if you have any input on the words, the sentiments, any criticisms you want to offer, you all know how to get a hold of me. I, I will make sure that uh, they are considered and reflected um, in the final plan. So uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll just uh, launch in here. So, uh, I think you're all pretty familiar with the fact that the national organization has grown at a fairly rapid clip over the past 10 years or so. Uh, what you see these bars in front of you represent about a 14% growth per year if you average that out over time. Uh, if you look at our different revenue sources, and I know some of you may be looking at this, I'm going to look at my big screen because this is hard for me to even see, but this, these bars represent different sources of revenue and the, the big, uh, the maroon bar is public funding. And you can see that, that that's a rocket ship ride for us. Uh, two strategic plans ago, continuing through last strategic plan, we made a conscious decision that we were going to begin to serve as a low cost service provider uh, to state and federal agencies who were seeing their budgets get cut. Um, and, and so we took over a lot of that restoration work. That's the growth that you see reflected here. Uh, the blue line, which your foundation revenue, it looks like it's in decline. It's not. It's really flat. What happened is that we received an additional $2 million from a big foundation in 2011. 
but, 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 but in fact, our foundation funding is relatively stable. The yellow is our uh, membership marketing funding. Uh, that's on a, on a slight incline. And then the two at the bottom, the green and the blue, represent uh, major, do major donor uh, giving. Uh, unrestricted is in green and uh, restricted funding is in blue. And when I say unrestricted, that means that we can spend it however we want, consistent with our mission work. And restricted means that a donor says that you can spend it, but I want you to spend it on burned area recovery, you know, from the Colorado fires. And then we, we allocate it over there. The reason I show you this is that we have, a, 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 a I think, a mature membership marketing program. It's still growing, but we have Given the demographic of our membership, we think we have plenty of opportunities to grow our uh, individual giving from major donors. Moving on to uh, the problem statement. The, the problem though is even though we boast growth that I think is better than any other conservation group of which I am aware in our marketplace, um, we are still uh, not keeping pace with the decline of trout and salmon. And so the challenge that we set for ourselves as uh, the people that are working on this plan, and I'll describe that process in just a moment, was how do we increase the scope and the scale of our, our, of our ability to reverse that trend, to begin to actually do to reverse the trend of salmon and trout decline across America. That's basically the problem we're trying to solve for in this plan. So uh, here's an agenda. Uh, I know you've seen a lot of this uh, before with the materials uh, we handed out in advance. So I'm gonna move fairly quickly to allow some time for dialogue, but uh, I'm gonna give you a little bit more background data and information because I think it's interesting and relevant. I'll talk a little bit about the uh, so-called discovery process and, and how we develop the plan and then touch very quickly on the framework again, because I know you have it, I know you will read it and I know you'll give me feedback, which we will absolutely uh, take into consideration. So when you look at uh, just doing a quick marketplace analysis of where TU sits in the pantheon of fish and wildlife conservation organizations. There's about 1.9 million what Kirk Dieter calls avid anglers in the U.S. And all the data I'm about to show you comes from the uh, RBFF, uh, Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation, uh, 2019 data. But so, so we have headspace. There is still room to grow in terms of doing a better job penetrating our core market of fly anglers. Um, you can see that our colleague organizations do a better job with DU really being the standard bearer in terms of market penetration. They have nearly 50% market penetration, meaning that 50%, nearly 50% of the people who duck hunt uh, also become DU members. Uh, we have, so we have, this is good news. We have room to grow. Although there's about 6 million fly anglers in the country, there's, as I mentioned, about 2 million that are avid. That means they go about 12 times a year. Uh, we have good potential uh, to grow in that area. The other thing I'll mention that's noteworthy is we often have a lot of discussion about how, how many people in these other organizations are active participants in their sport. We, we asked and answered that question. 96% or more of all of the members of these different organizations participate in the sport for which the organization is known. And that's the same for Trout Unlimited. Uh, you know, this is, again, not a big surprise for this group. We're a very white organization. Um, right now, racial minorities are the engines of uh, demographic growth in America. And the demographers tell us in about 25 years, people of color will represent more than 50% of the population in the U.S. Uh, we should try, we should strive to look at least more like uh, the fly fishing industry and the reason, or fly fishing demographic. And the reason for that is simple. We want to remain as relevant to as many people in America as we can. And the more people see themselves in an organization, the more they are likely, it's just human nature, to want to support that organization. So that's why we want to try to become a more diverse organization. Uh, we also want to become a younger organization. Um, if you look at this, I did the math this morning. 46% of TU is over the age of 61. And uh, contrary to popular belief, 25% uh, of the fly fishing community is over 55. There's, a, there's an idea out there that fly anglers are, uh, you know, tweed wearing, uh, pipe smoking, you know, older gentlemen. And that's actually not the case. It's a, it's a young demographic. So we have a lot of good news there, a lot of room to grow, a lot of potential for the organization. I'd also mention, although I don't have a slide, that 20% of uh, 
uh, the fly fishing demographic are women and about 7% of TU's membership are women. So we're gonna try to use this plan to become uh, younger and uh, more diverse as an organization. Again, because we think that will lead to us becoming uh, more effective. I think this may be the final slide for background data, but it's important. And I hope you can see that this is uh, looking at uh, unrestricted revenues. Again, these are the revenues that uh, we have the most latitude to spend to allocate where we think they need to be allocated. They're also, you know, a, a good, good for uh, having a rainy day fund. Um, so th there's two, two takeaways from this slide. Uh, th the good news is that when we get a dollar, we spend it, right? We are an incredibly efficient organization. We do not sit fat and happy. Um, we, we have this term we use, we eat what we kill. The bad news is that we have very little money in the bank for the kinds of investments that we need to make uh, to accomplish some of these big goals that I'm going to describe for you in a moment. If you, I'll just take three comparisons in case you can't read this bar chart. The second bar looks at a, an organization called the Ocean Conservancy. They, they have uh, an operating budget of about $30 million and they have $25 million in additional unrestricted net assets in the bank. Uh, moving toward the middle of the bar chart, you'll see the Wilderness Society. That's a about a $34, $35 million a year organization. They're sitting on top of about $22 million in unrestricted net assets. And then uh, moving down toward the right, one of our uh, third from the end is the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. They've got an operating budget very similar to ours of about 53 million and they have $48 million in the bank. Um, Trout Unlimited has an operating budget this year of about $58 million and we have about $4 million sitting in the bank. So, you know, making the, finding the resources to, to make the kind of investments we're gonna to need to make in this plan is gonna be very, very important for us. So just to talk a little bit about the process we went through, we probably went through the most re robust discovery process we've ever done as an organization. We had focus groups, we did stakeholder interviews with a combination of grassroots leaders, board members, donors, uh, partner organizations. We did a staff survey. We asked about 40 people to evaluate uh, the organization's uh, systems and technology in a so-called capacity diagnostic. We had a third party do what's called a best practices scan where they went out and compared TU in some critical areas to colleague organizations so that we could bring back good ideas that, that they discovered. It was a very, very rigorous process. Just forgive me there. And the results of that uh, process are in this uh, SWOT analysis that you see in front of you. The strengths won't be much of a surprise to, to this or to you all. You, you typify these. Uh, we're a, a prag pragmatic organization. Collaborative stewardship is at the roots of everything we do. Uh, our grassroots bring us political credibility and impact. Uh, we're not only bipartisan, we're nonpartisan. Uh, the work that we do in the field, we're able to leverage that uh, in, with support from dozens, hundreds, thousands of local communities across America. As I suggested, the weaknesses are, are also fairly well uh, stated. Uh, we've got, you know, an aging membership. We actually went from the time we finished our last strategic plan, we went from an average age of 58 uh, to today, we're about 62. Um, the lack of diversity has been said many times. Um, our systems haven't kept up with growth. I was trying to give you an analogy to help you understand what I mean by this. And I thought about this. When I started at TU, I'm in our Arlington office now. I have made myself the only essential employee to a non-essential business. But um, so when I started, we had 20, no, we had 30 people in the entire organization. And 22 of them were here in our Arlington office. Today, we have 25 people in the Arlington office, and we have about 200 and 250 people who are out in the field. That's great. It's awesome. It means that we, you know, we, we are lean and we, we're mean and we put people where the fish are, but it also means that we haven't made the necessary investments in back-end systems that uh, I'll talk about a little bit more in a moment. Um, there's also a, a comment in here about the lack of organizational integration uh, this is something that happens cross programs. So Western conservation connecting to volunteer operations. Sometimes we fall down on the job there. There's also uh, a disconnect that was talked about between often the grassroots, the chapters and the councils, councils and the national organization, sometimes between the 
national in the chapters. So that's something we wanted to really try to wrestle with in this plan. Lots of room to grow in plan giving, right? That, that, that demographic trend is bad news in one sense, but it's good news for plan giving. So we're gonna put a premium on that. Um, you know, the pandemic revealed that more people were, have been outdoors than ever before. We expect to see an explosion, an explosion in license sales from this year. Uh, the TU membership, by the way, is 10% higher right now than it was last year. Uh, I can't attribute it all to the pandemic, but I think it certainly uh, was part of it. And then we have a lot of potential to market, as I mentioned, to do a better job of penetrating the fly fishing market and other anglers, as well as conservationists who care about clean water but aren't yet members of TU. The threats, I think, are pretty well known as well. Just to give you a level of explanation on the COVID-19, we're not sure what's going to happen to COVID-19 with this uh, explosion of funding uh, for, you know, these various relief bills. Uh, we're heavily relying on, on state funding. States, most states have balanced budget requirements. We expect in several years, we're gonna see some downstream implications for us. Uh, climate change for cold water fisheries. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't need to tell you all what's happening in, in Colorado right now with the fires. A month ago, I could have had this conversation in California. Um, you know, it's, we're, we're in a bad uh, situation here relative to climate change. And then even, even before COVID-19, even before all the civil unrest, uh, associated with the um, uh, racial justice issues, the environment rarely uh, polls high. It's typically, they do a Gallup poll every year and it's typically in the, you know, if we crack the top 15, it's good news. It's not until we have a situation like the fires in Colorado that we can try to use that, and I don't mean to sound callous here, but to use that to actually advance our issues in a positive way, which I have every confidence Matt and us will do um, moving forward. So we, uh, we, we, Chris, Chris, I'm sorry, this is Bernard. Before you move on to the next chart, there were a couple of questions that came up on some of your other charts. It might be good to explain them. Oh, okay, I, I can't see uh, questions. No, I know you're, you're busy talking, but Larry Howe uh, wanted to ask the simple question, which we've been wrestling with a lot at the board and, and throughout this process. And why is uh, why are we NTU limited to fly fishers? What about those who, who fish for trout in other ways? Yep. Yep, we're, we're, we're not limited to fly fishers. It turns out that 92% of our membership are fly fishers, but uh, we are by no means exclusive to fly fishers. And part of what I'm going to describe in a moment, uh, we'll talk about how we widen the funnel and widen the tent to people who aren't even anglers joining TU. Forget about how they fish. They don't even have to be fishers to join us. All right, and then another question came up, and that was really about the source. If you could explain RBFF, which uh, was where you got some of the data from. Uh, the Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation. Um, it's, a, it's funded by the Fish and Wildlife Service, I think, but it's a part of the Department of Interior. It's been around forever. They pull together this data every year. It's, it's the uh, industry standard for fishing data. Okay, so... I just want to make sure we answered your questions there, Buck and Larry. Great, thanks. Well, and we'll, you know, I've only got three slides left, uh, so we can have plenty of time for questions at the end. I'm sorry, when I look at the presentation on my screen, I don't see questions come up. So just, just a little bit about the process of how we developed the draft uh, to where we are now. It took place through the summer and the fall, but I led a work group of staff. Uh, we got great input from the steering committee uh, that was led by the head of the NLC. That was comprised of an equal number and and, both, and Mac, Tom, and uh, Bernard were all members. And Jeff Witten may or may not have been a member of the steering committee. I can't recall, Jeff, forgive me. But the steering committee was comprised of about a third board members, a third grassroots leaders, and a third staff uh, from further down in the organization, just to make sure we had a really well-rounded perspective that were brought in. I did probably close to a dozen uh, meetings in, in evenings with uh, NLC and council chairs, chapter presidents. Uh, we had a lot of input from the staff. I will tell you that the uh, feedback from the chapter presidents and the other volunteer leaders, the council chairs and the NLC reps was incredible. Um, a couple of the, one of the fundamental big ideas in this plan is a direct derivative of that. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, as you saw from uh, what Mac and others shared with you, the you know, elements of the plan are, are, are fairly uh, standard to uh, strategic plans. We've, uh, you know, uh, I'm not gonna read these here, you can see them. The, the big ideas though, are 
where we, we proposed freshening the uh, mission and the vision statements. Uh, we wanted to have a very clear uh, problem statement so we know the problem that we're actually uh, trying to solve. We wanted to uh, broaden out our goals a little bit. You know, the, uh, the old model of protect, reconnect, restore, sustain is obviously something I'm, I'm proud of and, and very much believe in. And it does a great job at describing what the organization does. We wanted our, our goal to, to better explain the why we're doing it and where we're doing it. And I'll talk about that more in just a moment. Uh, we also wanted to make sure that our goals emphasize this notion of engaging uh, diverse communities in our work, because we think that will ultimately lead for a bigger army of conservation advocates for TU to help us grow the scope and the scale of the work. Um, and then we wanted to really pay attention to people in our goal statement. So you'll see that there. The, you know, we, we no longer want to simply eat well. Uh, I think we want to sleep well, too. And we want to make the necessary investments so that we're not burning people out. We're not burning volunteers out. We're giving you all the tools and the systems that you need uh, to be more effective volunteer leaders. And the staff feel very similar. The big idea throughout all of this, though, is how do we operationalize this concept of one to you? How do we make it something more than just a slogan on a hat or a piece of paper? And we actually put uh, strategies and programs into practice that allow us to uh, make that concept a reality. And so there's two really big ideas that I want to just talk to you about today and 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 and. and uh, put out there and maybe we get some feedback on today as well as whatever you uh, choose to uh, put in writing. One of the things that we're, we're trying to do is, and it's really the first goal statement, is to develop a national network of priority waters, which will direct our work over the next five years. Um, let me mention what I mean by this. So be, sadly, because uh, every trout, every cold water salmonid <laughs> Uh, in the United States has either been listed or proposed for listing or is otherwise a candidate species under the Endangered Species Act. We have tremendous data sets on these fish, but they reside everywhere. We also have some of the finest spatial analysis expertise in the country in the organization, in Trout Unlimited. We want to weave together all of this scientific data, overlay a wild trout layer on top of that by working with our partners at the state agencies, bring that to the chapters and the councils and have a really collaborative process where we talk about, okay, this is good, but we're missing these key areas hither and yon, include our friends at the federal agencies in the same process. And, and all of this is in service to the uh, Tom Sawyer School of Conservation, right? It doesn't matter if we grow at 25% every year for the next five years, we're still not, we're not gonna reverse the trend of trout and salmon decline. It's not gonna happen. If on the other hand, we can make our priorities, the same priorities of CDAO, of the Forest Service, of the BLM, of the Fish and Wildlife Service, now you're beginning to operate at scale. And that's basically what we're gonna try to do with this national network of priority waters. Um, it's, 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 it's one to you on steroids. It's not simply aligning the priorities of chapters and national staff. So, you know, the national staff are involved in these random acts of restoration over here and the chapters are working over here. It's, it's getting state and federal agencies to nod their heads in assent when we say, hey, we think this area is important. What do you think? And they're gonna say, yeah, well, we told you we think that's important. What happened when we developed the conservation success index, which is slightly derivative of this idea, was we went into the basement, we built it, and then we took it up and we said, look what we did everybody. And then, you know, I remember I was just talking with a colleague yesterday about this, the head biologist for the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, I'm sorry, for the U.S. Forest Service at the time, the head brook trout biologist, was our chief antagonist. And the reason he was our chief antagonist is because we didn't talk to him. And we're, we're not going to repeat that mistake this time. We have such deep relationship with the agencies right now at every level. We're going to make sure that this is a 100% collaborative process. Um, but it will allow us to operate at a scope and a scale that we've never before imagined. The second big idea I want to mention that helps, I think, to solve this problem is developing a brand new engagement model. Right now, our membership model is almost 100% transaction. If you send in $35, we'll send you a box of flies made in Africa and a hat. Um, you know, if you send in $1,000, we'll send you a fly rod that we get at cost. If you become a life member, you get a fly rod and reel. 
it's a very, very trans and, and almost 100% of our correspondence with our membership is putting our hand in their pocket. One of the things I learned through the chapter president calls, and this blew me away, and, and I know just about everybody on this call, I've been to your homes, I, I think I know a lot about this organization. I did not know this. So what I learned from the chapter presidents, we would go around and they would talk about what they were, what they were doing. And I would ask each of them a basic question. How many of the people that attended the stream cleanup, the tree planting, the local restoration project, the kids fishing day, the veterans fishing day, how many people were, of those people were TU members? And it was shocking to find out that the majority of people that go to those events are not members of our organization. We have a trustee, Mark Taylor, who said yesterday on a board call, he puts together a fun run for uh, an effort to save kokanee salmon. These are these cool semi, they're not anadromous. They're, I think they're called X, no, they're not exadromous. I'm embarrassed, I don't know. But they're, they're sockeye, but they don't run to the ocean. They run to a lake to spawn. And, and they're deeply imperiled in Washington state. And he put together a fun run. They raised a bunch of money for kokanee. He said that 95% of the people who showed up weren't TU members. So what if, what if we said to all these people, we want you to be part of the TU family by virtue, okay, maybe you're not gonna write $35 right away, but by virtue of giving back to these communities that you live in, by virtue of your service to our mission, we're gonna make you part of the family. We're gonna, we're, by virtue of your engagement, you're gonna be part of TU. And then we're gonna find, again, we're gonna use technology, something we've never done very well. We're gonna find out what, where these people live. Well, we, we'll know that based on when they show up. But what they care about, oh, you're here for a community science project. So you care about water quality, you care about science, you care about whatever river is we're at. And then we're going to market them, not information six months from the time that their membership expires and start banging on them to renew their membership. We're going to market them information on clean water and on science and on that river that they care about and other activities that we're doing in the places that they live. Because here's another secret. I'm, I just did a joint, we're, actually we're doing it next week. I'm sure some of you are members of Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. So Land Tawney is a buddy of mine, their, their CEO. Land and I are doing a joint fundraiser where I am asking, I'm a life member of BHA and I'm asking TU members to become a BHA member. And Land, who has just become a life member of TU, is going to ask uh, BHA members to become a TU member, right? It's totally contradictory, right? <laughs> Our, our, our direct mail people were fu are, are furious at us. Um, you know what we have that BHA doesn't have? We do stuff. I love land. I love BHA, but they do a lot of advocacy and policy stuff and they get good speakers and they have awesome pint nights. But we're actually in the streams and in the rivers making fishing better. We have, a, that's the secret sauce of this organization that we've never bottled up. And if we're able to actively grab all these people, bring them into the family and, and feed them the information that they care about, that they wanna consume, our belief is that some of those people will become donors. Will they ever attend a chapter meeting? I don't care, as long as they become a donor. And we know that their service to their communities is helping us increase the scope and scale of our mission work. And then the final thing I'll say here, and I'll shut up and uh, so I, I don't uh, take up more than half the time is, all of these ideas, and there are many more that you saw uh, drafted in that, in that document, they have to be paid for. And it's very likely that we're gonna end up doing, uh, if the board approves it, a capital campaign to help pay for this plan. This would probably be more of a, I think the fundraisers call it a comprehensive campaign. Just to give you a sense of something, this is gonna be shocking. We paid for the last two, two plans ago, we did a strategic plan we raised $100 $75 million it was the most we had ever raised. It paid for that plan. It began when I became CEO and it was a slog, but we did it. If we don't do anything differently over the next five years, if we just continue with the growth that we're at right now, we will be, we'll have to raise $440 million over the next five years. That's without doing anything. That's just continuing that public funding that we have right now. Now, you know, that we know that the situation is going to change because of COVID and no one's really certain what's happening. But um, we're talking about a Trout Unlimited at a fundamentally different scale than we have known historically. And our ability, if, if we're serious about this problem statement, if we're serious about reversing the decline of trout and salmon, the, the problem demands that we grow at that scale uh, to address the issue. So why don't I uh, just, well, just the, real quick, just to give you a sense of what's next here, uh, as, as I mentioned, we've never had uh, an implementation plan before. 
used to be that we were small enough that we could take the broad goals and strategies and feed them right into our employees' work plans. This is a different beast, right? We want this to implicate this fundraising campaign I'm talking about. It should, it should raise, it should help with fundraising for the local chapter. It should help with the Colorado Council. It should help with everybody. So we're going to have to map out what this looks like across the board. And we're going to put together a detailed implementation plan. Uh, this conservation network of priority waters, that's going to take some time to develop, especially if we do it the way it has to be done so people don't get their backs up and get bent out of shape uh, as we're developing it. They have to see themselves in it. They have to own it. Uh, again, the capital campaign, I mentioned that. Uh, you know, Again, I think we do such a good job of doing so many things around this country, but we, what we really don't do a super good job at is telling that story. Uh, and we don't have any marketing expertise really to speak of in the organization. So we're gonna make some significant investments in marketing and helping us and you to tell the TU story a little bit more effectively. I mentioned, you know, we're gonna to have to build this engagement model. Sounds fun to talk about, but what's it mean, Chris? <laughs> We've got to figure that out. Um, and then finally, the system stuff, I imagine if I were a volunteer, I'd be like, what is he talking about? This is, this is the kind of system that will allow chapters to better communicate with their members. Uh, for you to have a, a CRM, a customer relationship management tool that allows you as a chapter president to know what your members are interested in. So when Dave Nickham writes a cool blog on an area that's of interest to them, your database will know, I'm going to send that right out to Jimmy because Jimmy cares about the blog that Dave Nickham wrote about. We just want to have uh, technologies that allow us to better communicate through the TU line to help make this one TU uh, that we all talk about a reality. And so uh, with that, as I mentioned, we've got three trustees that are here, three or four trustees that are here. Why don't I stop the presentation, uh, see if there's any, um, any questions and we can begin the discussion. Okay, this is Tom. Um, I'm gonna uh, talk to just one, one issue real quick. Uh, when Chris talks about moving uh, one to you to uh, an increased scale, um, we have uh, what I counted was roughly 235 staff, 250, whatever it is, somewhere in there. Last year, we moved the volunteer hours from the from about 763,000 to 909,000 in the past year. If you look at that from a full-time equivalent employee basis, that's 483 people. So what, what the plan does is basically say, we're gonna try and take those full-time equivalent employees, meld them with our staff, and bring all of that to the head of a pin. Uh, so I think this, uh, there's huge promise here, huge promise. If we, don't, if we don't increase staff at all, if we can refocus what we're doing to the big ticket items, it will be really important. Um, that's all I'm gonna talk to. So David, do you wanna read this? Or we, we just want to open it up, open the mic up, or what do you want to do? This is David. I see Buck Skilling raised his hand, so I'm going to go ahead and it uh, looks like he is now unmuted. Uh, Buck, you had a question? Thank you, David. Um, on the diversity slide, obviously, we need to do a much, much better job of, um, of uh, diversifying our, our uh, uh, membership. Uh, certainly down here in the Five Rivers in Durango, uh, uh, we look to try to keep doing that. Uh, I know, I know for a fact our chapter has uh, at least two uh, members of color. Uh, my good friend, uh, fishing buddy is a uh, Chinese Hispanic extraction, uh, and the husband of one of our ex board members uh, is an African American. Uh, but appealing to uh, folks of color. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to go out and grab a, a person of color and say, hey, uh, I want you to become a member of Trout Unlimited. Let's go fly fishing. Uh, if they don't have an interest in fishing. So I think we need to come up with strategies. And I've struggled with this uh, because we, we definitely want to, want to grow that down here. We have a substantial Hispanic community as well as Native American community in our neck of the woods. Uh, 
I, I'm open, and I think a lot of people would be open to um, strategies that would would uh, uh, push that forward. And I, I I'm certainly uh, um, uh, in, uh, understanding and impressed with Chris's comments that a lot of folks that support us don't fish. Uh, certainly understand that. And with that, uh, I'm off. Thanks, Buck. I'll so I, I, well, I just quickly Googled RBFF just because I was a little unimpressed with my own answer of what it is. It's, um, they're, they're a, a nonprofit that's been around for about 20 years and their job is to uh, promote fishing, basically, all forms of fishing. And they're the keeper of the demographic data on fishing. They say that, and this includes, uh, you know, Hispanic, African-American, people of Asian descent, uh, they're about 30% of the fly fishing demographic right now. Um, and just so you know that they're a serious organization, they have like the head of SIMS on their board, the head of the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, the head of Pure Fishing, uh, you know, academic, academic people. And I know I have talked to so many to you uh, people who say, you know, I don't, I don't know any black people who fish or I don't know any people of color who fish, but, but they're out there. And part of the, part of the uh, uh, job of our equity practice is gonna be to develop intentional strategies to partner with those groups like Brown Folks Fishing and um, you know, uh, Afro Outdoors, and uh, there's a whole bunch of them. And we need to be intentional about connecting with them because they're gonna help us to become more relevant. Just, just along that line too, Buck, and I think it relates to the first question from Larry. Uh, you know, look, looking at it, uh, you know, interestingly, you'll have the opportunity to vote on the new trustees here at the annual meeting tomorrow. But one of the nominees that's up is a, a, a lady named Candace Price. And interestingly, Candace is an African-American woman out of Kansas City. Her and her husband have put together a television show that is on one of the black networks, which is really about African-Americans, people of color outdoors. It's basically outdoor life for people of color. And the reason I make that point, they really make the point in here, and it goes back to fly fishing. Uh, you know, the, the reality is that most places where cold water exists and where trout exists, there aren't a lot of urban areas and there aren't a lot of African Americans and people of color. All right. So the idea that we need to expand and, 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 and welcome people uh, of uh, in other geographies and bring them and connect them back to the whole idea that what we're about is conservation and, and, and fishing and the connection to that, I think is really, really critical if we expect to grow. If we just keep doing the same uh, stuff and, and, and doing it where we've always been doing it, it's going to be much more difficult. So there's a great article in Outdoor Life. Uh, I think, Chris, we ought to post it up on our website if we have the right <laughs> rights to do that. But if we could post that up there, it really tells a great story about what the prices are doing and why they got engaged and involved in outdoor life activities. Uh, she in particular, Candace, was somebody who grew up in the city and just very quickly, anecdotally, uh, Candace, her first date with her husband, he took her pheasant hunting and she had never uh, held a gun in her hands or let alone been outdoors in her life and it kind of hooked her from there on and she became an advocate of all things outdoors. So. Uh, part of it is getting people connected uh, with the outdoors and making that that an introduction to them. Uh, can I chime in for a minute? Please. So this is uh, Ben Bloodworth. I'm our uh, Northwest Regional Vice President here on the uh, Colorado State Council. Um, just wanted to let you guys know and uh, Buck, you as well, that uh, we are kind of already um, proceeding with some of the some of the thoughts that have been um, given so far, and that we are uh, have put together a little bit of a think tank group um, made up of uh, folks from uh, BHA Rocky Mountain Sportswomen, Brown Folks Fishing, uh, Pig Farm Inc., and uh, have connected with um, Afro Outdoors as well. Um, and then our uh, Greenbacks chapter, who I don't know if you know much about them, uh, Chris, but they're yep. they're kind of doing that model you presented of who cares if anybody's a member, let's just uh, go get stuff done. Um, and so 
we were bringing this group together to chat and talk about um, at that kind of state board level what we guidance we can provide chapters for getting more more people outdoors um, a more diverse group um, and I just want to know I, I think it's odd um, some of the ways we go about doing some things sometimes and I work for a small nonprofit doing uh, restoration all over the southwest and I was thinking about it and I cannot think of a program we do that we don't partner with someone else. Um, and Trout Unlimited is great at partnering with other people to get projects done. Um, if it's the BLM or the Forest Service or a local water, other watershed group, it's great. But I think we need to focus on exactly what you were talking about, Chris, with BHA and partnering with other groups to get more people outdoors and involved in um, conservation. And, you know, for me, I don't, I don't care if they join TU or Rocky Mountain Sportswomen. If, if we're getting them outdoors and involved in conservation, then, then I think that's the goal. And um, so I, I think it's awesome that you're talking with Land um, and BHA about that. I have a great relationship with our BHA guy here locally. He's also a TU member. And um, so, yeah, I think it's a, something we need to focus on as an organization is not just partnering on projects, but partnering on membership and involvement. Yeah, Ben, that's really well said. Thanks for your work over there. I'm going to ask Tom a question in a moment. Let me let me finish this thought though. So just another in another illustration of what you were just saying, Ben. There's a, a young woman named Morgan Stum who used to run our Five Rivers program at uh, Frostburg State in Maryland, or maybe it's West Virginia. But um, uh, she's now like an AmeriCorps employee with us. And she was on the steering committee. And she said that when she would, would arrange as part of the Five Rivers program, a fishing outing, she would get um, like three or four people would come. And when she did a, a stream cleanup or a city, they call them uh, community science projects, she'd get like 20 people who showed up, most of whom didn't fish, but they all went out there and they helped pick up trash all afternoon long, or they went out and uh, you know took DO levels and uh, sediment levels and temperature monitoring and those people are part of the TU family. We should just recognize it and, and make it formal. But your comments were all overall excellent. Just in the interest of uh, how this plan just rips off good ideas from others. Tom, who was the chapter? Who was it again that sent that incredible uh, climate analysis and cold water fisheries nexus that you and I talked about? Dolores River Anglers was the, was the chapter that did it. Uh, yeah. So, so, so the, what Ben is talking about is the predicate for our engagement model and what Dolores River Anglers did is, is, is not dissimilar to what we're gonna end up doing with this network of priority waters. If you hey, this is Joel Evans, I've got a comment. Hey, uh, Joel Evans here. So just a comment, uh, Chris, uh, not so much a question. But um, I certainly agree with all the uh, diversity and uh, youth initiatives. I believe that's critical. But uh, also speaking as a member of the senior male group, uh, I think when you go forward with those plans, you also have to respect that um, knowledge and base of experience with the current older membership that we're trying to expand from and connect those groups, socially, meetings, uh, events, whatever. Part of the formal plan needs to say, here's a group that has a lot to contribute still. And to go forward, we've got to add youth and diversity, but don't leave the seniors behind. You know, there was um, federal child education movement uh, with the U.S. government called No Child Left Behind. So I think TU has to have a um, no senior left behind, be a part of all that also. Joel, Thanks. what a what a wise comment. You're absolutely right. I mean, this is, I've, I've written about this in, in blogs in the past. And for, in fact, I wrote one called Why Diversity Matters. And I made this point. Um, 
we stand on the shoulders of giants in this organization. We benefit from so much wisdom across to you. And, and it really is our job to figure out how to allow a younger generation of conservationists, whatever the color they are, uh, to also benefit from that wisdom. And, and, and being intentional about that, I think is gonna be really, really important. So thank you for saying that, Joel. Say, hey, this is Jeff Wood. And if I could ask a question, I'd like to get some input from, um, <clears throat> from, uh, the, from, from all you people in Colorado, respect so much. The, uh, I'm, I'm thinking in terms, and Jeff Dean just uh, uh, chatted up a good question about female participation. A, a uh, kind of a model or a subject I've been tossing around is the women's alternative engagement model. That is where uh, perhaps there's a, a female dominated or female even exclusive fly fishing or trout fishing or whatever organization where, where participants in those organizations may or may not be TU members and supporters. What I'm looking for is some feedback from this group as to, uh, are you familiar with these groups? How do you um, engage them or do you engage them? Should we? What successes, what failures, what, uh, you know, how, how, how could we grow that uh, uh, input from those uh, alternative engagement groups? Let me weigh in on that if you don't mind. Uh, two things um, uh, that I forgot to mention. One thing I forgot to mention earlier, when we do chapter meetings, we have to get out of our comfort zone and get away from our cliques and engage new people and people that surely don't look like us. Um, now on the subject of, uh, of the ladies, uh, we here in uh, Durango have an organization by the name of Braided, uh, started by uh, uh, some young ladies and it is oriented to getting ladies in fly fishing. Uh, one of our board members, um, Pauline Ellis is uh, ex US Forest Service, and Pauline is um, uh, one of our. Uh, I said I mentioned one of our board members, one of our leaders. She's also vice president of Braided here in Durango. Uh, so there is a connection there, and we're working very hard to uh, recruit those ladies to uh, join Trout Unlimited if they would. Uh, we also have, as you know, Kara Armano. Uh, who is a, a Trout Unlimited staff member, uh, lives here in Durango. She is also on the Five Rivers Chapter Board. And uh, Kara is one of the founders of Artemis, which is an organization that promotes hunting and fishing uh, for the ladies. Um, it's, a, it's a challenge, quite honestly. I've been to braided meetings and um, uh, haven't uh, haven't got much gotten much in the way of engagement because it seems the ladies want to um, connect with and chat with the ladies. Uh, part of it could be the fact I'm an old guy and uh, most of these ladies were uh, uh, younger, uh, and I can totally appreciate that. Uh, that's a challenge we all have, and it's a challenge we have to work through because I agree completely. We need more. Uh, more ladies involved. Um, they do a great job of leading, and um, quite honestly, if our if our uh, national, uh, not national TU, but uh, our nation overall had more ladies, we'd be in a heck of a lot better shape. Thanks for listening. Corinne, do you want to jump in? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Buck, for bringing up Braided, because one of the things that I think is beautiful about Braided, while they're target is to get women involved. They aren't exclusive to women. So like Buck mentioned, he has gone to braided meetings and everyone is welcome. And that's one thing that I want to caution against is the exclusivity or the women's only, because honestly, I don't think that that, while there are groups of women who feel more comfortable in a group of just women, I think TU will be better off if we're all together. I personally feel very comfortable in a group of male anglers, no matter the age. But I think part of that is that I'm a highly skilled angler and I'm really involved in conservation. And so I can really hold my own. I think the number one thing 
that TU members can do is to basically treat everyone as if they belong. And for me, it's, it's not like grabbing some woman and going, oh my God, you're here. This is so wonderful. Let, let's put you in this role, this role, this role, this role. It's more just, you're another member that's really valuable to us, just kind of the same as everyone else. And I know Barbara can speak to this and I saw, thought I saw Aaron on the line. Um, Aaron Kreider has done a great job involving more women in fishing and that's the gateway for women even more than men. We talk about how we get more members and on the surveys, at least in years past, why are you a TU member? Women answered because I like to fish at a higher percentage than even men did. Um, so. Barb, any, any comments oh, on that? Um, yeah, I'll let Corinne finish um, and Dick also raised his hand, but I'd like to respond also, please. I'm finished. I think you're up. Um, yeah, to answer um, your question a little more directly, I guess, um, we're talking about a couple of things, but the question was like, how do we go about engaging with some of these groups? And, you know, some chapters are like Buck's example are engaging with the groups in their community that are um, women or non-binary gender groups that are um, in fly fishing. Um, we've also done it through our um, volunteer pools and specifically we've used string girls to and then make um, alliances with these groups with uh, Colorado women fly fishers with um, Ava women. Um, we'd like to do it with braided, we're working on that. Um, so the way we are going about it is just the way that we do with alliances and partnerships for conservation and restoration. Um, I think Ben really hit the nail on the head. We have to do the exact same thing and make alliances and partnerships um, culturally um, with the groups that are cropping up of people, like-minded people pursuing the fly fishing too. So that's, that's kind of how we're going about it. And um, ideally we amp this up um, and, and do it, continue to build that into our strategies and people are to work together because everyone's resource constrained and if we can work together we all um, benefit and by pairing our resources and get that boost out of it that's great um, um yeah. Bar barbara and connie great great points i really appreciate that input but let me let me ask you perhaps for a little bit more connie what what percent of women you think would be comfortable integrating into an existing chapter? Is it closer to 10% or 90%? That's one question. And then uh, the, the question then for both of you is that w whether they, how, how do we go about doing what you're, you're suggesting we do? How do we make that integration happen? How do we especially go after uh, uh, participation from those that may not feel as comfortable joining an existing chapter? What, how, how do we do it? What are you, what are you doing? What, what's the secret sauce, as Chris would say? Um, my name is Corinne, not Connie, but the, I don't have the secret sauce. I am just, in my experience, I have seen that the TU model of we want to get women involved is we're going to create this group of women over here. Um, which certainly you need to target women to get them involved, but more importantly, we need to see women as a part of TU, the entire organization, not this alternative group that we're trying to target separately. Um, we need to go about it the same way that we unite everyone. We make a welcoming environment. We talk fishing, we talk favorite streams, we talk restoration projects that are 
um, going on in people's backyards. It's kind of the age old treat everyone the same um, piece for me. And I certainly do not have percentages of of what will work and, and all well, of I, it. I, but I'm gonna push you there, but uh, of the, uh... Of a woman's group, do you think it's more or less than 50% that would feel like joining an existing chapter is the, good thing, is the right way to go? I'm not a member of any like women's only groups. So I'm a member of TU, I'm a member of BHA. And I know that there's a lot of work to be done to kind of heal past wounds, I think. I think a lot of women have felt left out in the past or not welcome or looked down upon in fishing as well as conservation and to you specifically. And so it's, it's a little bit more of a righting the wrongs through action, you know, like if there is a group in your area like braided, Buck's really lucky to have braided in his area to just start going to the, to their meetings and saying, hey, our next meeting is about X, Y, Z. Can you come? Personal invite. Um, and they already know Buck when they show up. And so they've got a friendly face. And if Buck brings two of his friends, obviously this is when we can actually be in the same room with one another, but um, just making those personal connections. Hey, Corinne, can, yeah. can you please not tell Land what I said? <laughs> Never. No, I mean he knows it. I love it. He's the best. Right. <laughs> hey guys, I'm, I'm just watching our clock here. Uh, Barb, yeah, Barb, how exactly. about how about one one uh, last comment, and then I want to get oh, to okay. Dick Jeffries who who raised okay. his. I, mean, I don't know any specific numbers. Just from being involved in a couple of groups, it seems to me that there's already a high degree of overlap, and what we have to remember as Trout Unlimited uh, is the mission of these groups is different. And, um, and a lot of women are members both of a women's fly fishing group focused on fishing together as women, traveling together, uh, learning together, and they're members of Trout Unlimited where they participate as volunteers, chapter leaders, um, and just basic members too. And so um, the, the objectives and the mission of the groups are totally different. And so I'm, I'm with Corinne 100%. Um, the, we, I think we go down the wrong path into you to create women's membership that's in some way separate. What, how does that actually further our goal? I'm not sure. Um, it should be about people, uh, you, know, pr you know, protecting water for the people and fish, period. Great, uh, it's Mac. Uh, Dick, you had sent an email over. I forwarded it to Chris Wood. I think that's where probably your question was going that Matt brought up. Do you want to address that? Uh, thanks, Mac. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, actually, <clears throat> since it's kind of a, a multifaceted, you know, topical conversation this morning, I've got three or four notes, and I'll try and be brief. Um, it, it, just my observation on uh, our, our discussion about cultural diversity. I think all organizations, whether they're NGO, for-profit, governmental, we have this innate ability to recognize and state the obvious and where we drop the ball is if we want to affect change is that that's where we we, we kind of tend to drop the ball i, I think it's important that uh, on the at the big picture level uh, since we're a grass or uh, grassroots organization this is uh, uh this applies both from the bottom up as well as top down and if we want to be successful at creating cultural diversity within the organization we have to I believe first create cultural diversity within our leadership. It's really, um, I, I think we're setting ourselves up for failure to take the typical uh, leadership group, whether it's local, state, or whatever, that is probably the majority, uh, you know, comprised of 60, 70 year old white guys 
<laughs> that are trying to uh, either engage people of color or um, genders, you know, what, whatever demographic group we're after. So I, I would throw that out as something that maybe everybody needs to take an inward look at first is um, where are we at uh, ourselves uh, within our own little uh, env satellite environment in regards to uh, cultural diversity. Um, going back uh, to Chris's presentation, um, scope and scale in the in defining the problem and, and i know it's hard to go back and do all this other stuff so i'm not asking that stuff be changed but <clears throat> what i what i thought was interesting that um talking about scope and scale there wasn't also the inclusion of efficiency um and i get the fact chris as you put it you know we earn a dollar we spend a dollar so that indicates that you know financially we're a very efficient organization but I don't think that we can allow ourselves to lose sight that there are efficiencies spread out uh, both administrationally and operationally that we always have to continue to stress uh, that should be a, a guiding value for what we do. Um, we're, we're just in a constant environment of, of uh, scarce dollars, challenging uh, resources and whatnot. So I, I think it's just important that we recognize that um, trying to strive efficiency across all operational fronts uh, and administrative fronts is important. Um, second thing I wanted to point on, uh, and again, Chris, not picking on you, never would do it, love you to death. Um, <laughs> you were talking about uh, kind of the messaging around TU uh, about how we get out in the river and streams uh, to make fishing better. Um, I do think that's a point that we need to um, kind of take that stop in time and say, wait a second, what is the message we're trying to do uh, or to deliver? Um, I think the public at large needs to better understand our internal belief of, and, and I always phrase it this way, if it's good for fish, it's good for people. Yeah. And so I, th I think we don't do a good job of getting that message out that the things that we're doing for fish because it's kind of built within our mission um the one of the primary outcomes of that is we are we are improving and protecting these environments that these fish live in and that has a direct beneficial outcome on people downstream or or somewhere within that watershed or multiple watersheds or whatever that they're realizing a direct beneficial impact from and I think if we can do a better job of getting that message out, that helps us create the emotional nexus that is needed that, that creates an environment that those people all of a sudden want to engage in what we do. And it's not about fishing. It's because we're doing stuff that is, you know, benefiting them in other ways that doesn't put a, a rod and a reel in their hand. And then uh, just the last thing, and then I'll, I'll kind of be done. Um, this does kind of go back to the overarching, uh, this new look that we're uh, kind of doing from national TU at the next 50 years. Um, and I, I think what we're lacking, in, and this is my opinion, I think we're missing the opportunity to embed um, Maybe it goes into mission, vision, I'm not sure where, but we have, uh, uh, we, I think we have a need to include two key words in what it is that we do um, in our watersheds. One is resilience and the other one is sustainability. We, we have it inserted when we get out in, into goals, we talk about resilient fish populations and that's fine, it should be there. But again, this kind of goes back to our, our ability to address our needs in the next 50 years. Uh, we know things aren't, you know, things are not going to change as far as how we're always struggling to find resources to put at play within the work that we do. And so I think it's important as an organization that uh, across the nation that we um, that we stress the importance of everything that we do be founded in those practices either being um, shown to be uh, an outcome of resilience for fish populations and furthermore sustainable fish populations. And those two things 
in my mind, in practical application, are not always the same. Um, you know, if you have a resilient population, that doesn't mean it's sustainable. If you have a sustainable population, there's a tendency that it's going to be resilient, but um, it, not always. And, and, and my kind of my founding focus is, is if we move that up to where it's more at a mission vision level, then in order to follow through on that organizationally, it kind of forces us at the local level, project level, national level, state level to identify and integrate metrics that then measure resilience and sustainability. And, and it's almost like a truth test. Um, if, if you at, at your chapter level, you at your state level, you at your national level, you want to engage resources into a project, you, you need to go through the process of ensuring that that the outcome provides for a resilient population or a sustainable population. And that can then broaden out to what's happening in a watershed. So those are my four things. That's great. If I just can take a minute, even though I know we're probably over here, that's just such a great comment. I, I, I've taken a bunch of notes, Dick, thank you. Um, I will tell you that resilience is at the heart of everything we're talking about. The, the whole idea of a network of priority waters is basically based on the portfolio concept for trout recovery, which Dick, you probably know is, is based on three attributes, resilience, representation, and redundancy. So, so resilience will be baked into the creation of that na national network. There'll be other things that are built into it too, but that's gonna be at the core of this. And I'm just chuckling to myself because we had so many conversations about resilience and sustainability and it was in the initial vision. We had all these different adjectives that made it in. And finally, we decided, let's just go with healthy. <laughs> you know? Because if it's healthy, it's got to be resilient. If it's healthy, it's got to be sustainable. But your, your words are well said and well taken. And the only other thing I really want to comment on, because I could not agree with you more about leadership at the, you know, sort of starts at the top. Um, and with, through Bernard's leadership and with uh, the other three trustees, Mac, Tom, and uh, uh, Jeff, who are on the phone, we, we are hopefully voting on and, and welcoming uh, the most diverse class of uh, trustees we've ever had. Three people of color will be joining our board, not because they are people of color. They are all incredibly talented and gifted people, but they also happen to be of color. And that will make TU a little bit more of a friendly organization when someone looks at the top and they say, oh, okay, well, that's cool. I can see myself there. And, and I'll also say that, again, I didn't hire her for this reason, but I hired our first uh, woman of color on the senior staff uh, just this past week um, as a general counsel. And again, we didn't hire her for that reason. She just happens to be a woman of color, but I directed the search team that I wanted to have two people of color in the people that I interviewed. And I think it's those kind of intentional steps we need to take to make the points that you made so well just a moment ago. I'd also point out, uh, Chris, Chris. You know, that Chris, this slate also has the largest number of, of female uh, trustees on the board also. We'll have now uh, close to 40% of our trustees will be female on, on the board. Yep. Fantastic. Guys, I, I hate to do this. Um, but I've got a goal of, of keeping us some relatively on time today. Um, so a, a huge thank you to Bernard. I, I, I pronounced it Bernard previously. Apologize. Um, and to Chris for joining us today. And for, for Tom and Mac for, um, for wrangling them and getting them out here. Appreciate you guys doing that. Um, and, you know, this is an exemplary of one TU right here, right? We have national leadership, um, state leadership, and then the chapter level. So it's wonderful to see and thank you for the discussion and the questions and for